morning and happy new year to you. Let's get out our Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, I'll get back into the book of Acts and we'll continue through that the book next week. But I wanted to do a New Year's message today. And so, uh, so that's what we're going to do. And the title of my message is One Thing. Philippians chapter 3. I still hear pages turning. I always love, though, to hear Bible pages turning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and this place that we, as your church, can gather into this building and, Lord, we can spend time together as a family, a body of believers singing your praise. And, Lord, just... Uh, Lifting up your name, and uh, Lord, with a, a desire and a, and a heart, Lord, to bring you honor and to bring you glory. And Lord, I pray now that as uh, we meet together and have spent time worshiping you, that that worship will continue as we open your word. Lord, that you would speak to each one of us. You've brought us here to meet with us uh, with plan and purpose. You've got a message for us to hear Lord, uh, fill me with your spirit to that end because we invite the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. May he be welcome here among your people. And Lord, may you teach us from your word. And Lord, I pray that you would give to uh, those who hear, Lord, ears to hear what your spirit would say. And Lord, as always, we pray if there's anyone here that has not yet given their life to you, God, that they would sense your love and your life in this body of believers, in your people. And Lord, that they might come today and, and make a decision to give their lives to Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray that your spirit would speak to them, that you would convict them, and that you would draw them to yourself, Lord. And so we ask you to bless this time now of study in your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that every year that God gives us on planet Earth is a year where we ought to be as productive as we can for His work, furthering His kingdom, being as pleasing as we can be that we might bring Him glory, that we would live every day with that in mind, you see, because here's what I've realized. The longer I live, uh, some of you older folks will uh, concur with this. Some of you younger folks will go, nah, 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 that's what I always hear. But it's true, isn't it? The longer I live, the more quickly life seems to pass. Christmas when I was a kid seemed like forever from one Christmas to the next. It no longer seems that way. In fact, we were just in the back room talking about taking the Christmas decorations down, which I don't really want to do because I think it looks nice. Uh, and working on the Easter, uh, you know, thing. I mean, Easter, it, it used to be, man, so long between all that stuff. But as you get older, you, you start to say the stuff, the old, remember when Grandma used to, I remember when I was a kid and Grandma used to say, boy, you kids just grow up so fast, you know, you just seems like just, you're just sprouting up, you know. And where's time going? Those kinds of things. When you're young, you don't say that. Because for some reason, and it's true, it seems like forever from first grade to second grade. It seems like forever from first grade to being a senior and graduating. Remember how long school seemed, huh? Seemed like, so I can't wait to get out of school. I can't wait to get out of school. I can't wait so I don't have to do no more teachers, you know, more pencils rather, no more books, no more teachers, dirty looks, you know, the whole scene. <laughs> Now, I know we have teachers in here, and you don't do that, but. 
But time passes so quickly. And so what happens is, is, is as you get older, you realize that the years are passing by and you don't have a lot of time left. And so you want to maximize the time that you have. You want to do what you ought to be doing. Live like you ought to be living. And of course that hope and that desire springs in all of us to some degree uh, because the reality is, is any time we come to a new year, we approach a new year, well, there is something that occurs, something that most people do, or that many, I should say. Every year, at least half of us will do something at the very beginning of the year will be initially exhilarating, but tragically, by the end of the year, the exhilaration has descended into frustration. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about New Year's resolutions. Some of you have made them. According to the US dot, USA.gov, the top 10 resolutions that Americans make every New Year's Day are the following. And I'm sure you can all guess number one. First service did. What's, what's the number one New Year's resolution? That's right. That, why do we know that? Wow. The second one is manage debt. And save money. Third on the list is get fit physically. Fourth on the list is eat healthy. I, I think there's an extra motivation for that because we've eaten so poorly over the last month. We've had pies and cakes and cookies and candy that we don't normally eat, so we, we haven't been eating too healthy. So I think that is uh, just kind of a natural thing that happens. A uh, fifth is learn something new. A six is drink less alcohol. That's because many have a hangover um, and uh, want to stop that. And uh, a seventh is quit smoking. Eight is reduce stress. Nine is take a trip somewhere. And ten is volunteer to help others. Now listen, all those New Year's resolutions, those are good. But the fact of the matter is, the problem is, is four out of five who make them will break them. One-third statistics say of people who make resolutions won't even get past the end of January before they break them. In fact, my sister was uh, talking about this a few days ago when, we, when she was over. She goes, yeah, she goes to the gym all the time. She goes, oh, I hate this New Year thing. And she says, because what happens is, is at the beginning of the year, you know, uh, the gym's going to be really crowded for the next month and a half. And then, then it'll all go away. <laughs> you see, that's what we're going to talk about today. I believe that what we need is not so much New Year's resolutions as a New Year revolution. We need a revolution. You see, what does God say to us when it comes to these resolutions? When it comes to the desire to change and to do things better and to put things in order? He has plenty to say about how we can maximize every year that he gives us. That we might, well, live to our God-given potential. To live fully, to live the life abundantly that he has designed and desires for us to live. You see, change, people like to make changes and that's what these resolutions are all about. The, but the fact, why, the fact of the matter is, as many fail, why do people keep failing when it comes to New Year's resolutions? Why is it that so many of us have come 
to the end of one year with the same baggage we carried the year before. In fact, many of us, especially when you get older, you quit making New Year's resolutions. Why? Because you know what's happened previously. And so some lose hope that things can ever change significantly. Why? Because we're not any further along, perhaps, in our spiritual lives, our social lives, our physical lives, our vocational lives than we were the year before. The date has changed for many, but the destination hasn't. We're stuck in the same place. Why is that? Well, a psychology professor at Florida State University did a study of this. He came up basic, with basically two reasons why people fail to keep New Year's resolutions. Ready for the, for the reasons? Number one, the resolutions are too general. They're not specific enough. And number two, there are too many. It's like that part of your brain that needs to change. It's like walking into the gym and you say, all right, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deadlift 600 pounds first time in. Never warmed up, never practiced, never lifted weights before. But I'm going to make a change this year. I'm going to pick up 600 pounds over my head. Boom! What are you going to do? You're not going to pick up 600 pounds over your head. You're going to hurt something. That's what's going to happen. Or someone. You see, you can't just start there. And so we don't want to start small. We start with all these things. This year we're going to change this and this and this and this and this and this. And you make your list and you check it twice. And you, you want to change, but, but you fail and falter. You see, willpower is a limited resource. If you make too many resolutions, you won't have enough reserves to stick to all of them. Thus, his conclusion the psychologist, it's better to make one resolution and stick to it than make five. You know what? That's good advice. That's a good word. In fact, it's right here in our text. Paul says the same thing. Here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is writing towards the end of his life from a Roman prison. As far as he knew, every day could be his last one. So in a sense, for him, every day was New Year's Day. You see, he gives us a secret of how to make every new year the best year ever. Isn't that what you want for 2016? He gives us a secret of how to make that happen. And it starts, it starts with a admission, a straightforward, honest admission, which is a starting point for making your life better on a daily basis for anybody. What is that admission? Well, I'm, I'm reading out of the English Standard because I like the way it's worded. But you can read along with me there in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. What's Paul saying here? Well, he's admitting something that we all need to recognize. Uh, none of us have arrived yet. We're not there. And none of us, I think, we could agree, have it all together. I thought by now, as a Christian, I'd be done with some sins and struggles because I'm too old for them. Can I tell you? You never outgrow sin. The battle still rages. It doesn't get easier. You see, because we are in a war, spiritually. Now, I don't want to discount the fact that God has done a lot, and He's made a lot of changes, and He's given me a lot of victories. 
With all that he's done, though, there's still more to do. With our, everywhere he's taken me, there are still more places to go. Though I have reached a, a lot of the potential and been allowed the privilege to serve and to pastor at this church for uh, 31 years now. I'm not done. There's still more to do. There's still more potential. And you know what? I don't care how old you are in years. If you are still drawing breath and you're here and doing so, I assume you're breathing. There's always new lessons to learn. And that's what I learned. There's always more principles to apply. There's always more room to grow. And Paul here in our text gives us three simple steps. I haven't arrived. I haven't attained. You see, I haven't made it yet. But here's what I do. Here's what I do. I'm on the course. I'm on the road. I'm pressing forward. I'm moving ahead. But if you're going to move ahead, if this year is going to be uh, more blessed than last year, if you are going to see a, a greater degree of God's glory, if you are going to experience more of His purpose and power in your life, guess what? There's some things you need to do that Paul lays out here. What are they? Well, number one, Forget what is behind you. Forget it. That's what he's saying there in verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I haven't made it yet. I haven't arrived yet. But guess what? I've learned something. I need to forget if I'm going to continue to progress and move ahead. I need to forget the things that are behind. Paul had learned a tremendous lesson. You can't focus on where you are going as a Christian until you focus, until rather you forget on uh, where you've been. You see, when you read this passage, you realize that Paul here, in a pretty short order, is uh, using a sports, athletic event type language. He's talking more specifically, as we read our text, about a race. He's talking about straining forward and pressing on and going toward a goal and reaching the prize. Those are all racing terms. Listen, if you're a runner, then you know the wise words of those who are more experienced runners who say to you, just remember, as you run, where you've been is not important. What is important is where you are and where you're going, where you're headed. That's true about your life. Someone has said you can't sail the ship of your life into the seas of the future with joy and peace if your anchor is stuck in the mud of the past. How many of you are stuck in the mud of the past failures? Stuck in the mud of past hurts? Stuck in the mud of bitterness and, and resentment? You can't run forward if you're always looking backwards. That's why Paul here says, forgetting those things. This is an action that you must take. This is a decision that you must make. I must forget the things which are behind. Now, now listen, I don't want you to misunderstand what the word forget means. It doesn't mean fail, to fail to remember. There's no way you can ever totally erase the past from your memory, is there? You know your failures. I'd like to block some of them out. You know your mistakes. You know the hurts. I'd like to take them all away. But, but that, well, that's not going to happen. You see, that word forget 
doesn't mean so much, it doesn't speak so much about erasing it from your memory. It literally means in the Greek to not be influenced or affected by. For example, when God says, I will remember your sins no more, it doesn't mean that God all of a sudden comes up with a, you know, a case of Alzheimer's or, or dementia. He's not getting spiritual dementia. He simply means he no longer allows your past failures and sins and mistakes to affect your relationship to him in the present. For that, I'm thankful. I heard about a man who went to see a doctor, and he said, Doctor, you got to help me. The doctor said, why? What's wrong? The man says, I'm suffering from amnesia. What do I do about it? The doctor says, just go home and forget about it. <laughs> Wish it was that easy, huh? Here's what you need to do as you look back over 2015. You think about your mistakes. You think about your failures. You think about the things that you didn't do. You think about the things that you should have done. The things that you shouldn't have done. Here's what you do. You ask yourself, what can I learn from these things? And how can I make a, a, a better you know, decision next time? How can I move ahead, you see, and grow from what I've known and experienced? Do you know how you can really know that you've forgotten what's behind you? When you can talk about it. When you can talk about it, when you can honestly say, yeah, I did fail there, or I did make a mistake here, and here's what I've learned. Here's, here's what I've learned in this. And that's why I won't ever do it again. This is how God used this. I, I, I blew it here, but you know what? It, it, uh, there was a pain there. Uh, there was a problem in this situation. Uh, but guess what? I've grown through this. I've learned from this. And here's what God has shown me. It's been a tough year for me. I don't like what, what I've uh, revisited. Uh, I, I, I think I'm doing well. And then God does things and changes things. And I don't, you know, I discovered the older I get, I don't know about some of you, but I don't like change. I mean, well, let, me, let me clarify that. I don't like change unless I'm making the change. I don't like it when God kind of comes in and he says, okay, things have been going well. You know what? Uh, there's a growing season here. We're going we're gonna to make some adjustments and change because things are pretty comfortable and going along pretty smooth and pretty well. So guess what? I'm going to make some changes. And guess what? He moves people, you see, and moves them on. I, I, I don't want people to leave. I want them to stay. I, you know, I mean, and yet I know that God calls people to leave. In fact, the church is all about raising up people and doing what? Sending them to go out and to preach the gospel. And two people who I love dearly, God has taken out this year, and I don't like that. On the one hand, on the other, I realize, guess what? That's what God does. I talked to Casey yesterday, and, um, or the day before yesterday, and he uh, told me to pray uh, because they finally got a place to meet on Thursdays, not, not any place on Sundays yet down there in Pasadena, and they are going to be meeting regularly on Thursdays and, and uh, down there in the city, and, and uh, God's doing a work down there, and and, and, and I'm glad God's doing the work down there, but, but it's, it's been an adjustment for me up here. Okay? I miss him. I love him. I love Matt. I miss Matt. But when God moves people on, none of you belong to me. I don't belong to you. We all belong to who? 
God. And when he makes changes that we don't like, that's when we get to go, okay, God, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And we die to ourselves and our own thing. And we wish it was different, right? I wish, I wish this wouldn't happen. I wish that wouldn't happen. I wish we had this like it used to be, you see, like it used to be. Listen, uh, hopefully none of us are like we used to be. The goal is to become more like Jesus, you see, daily. And if we are going to do that, we can't live on what we wish, what we hoped would have, what, how things might have been different. We need to take where we're at and say, here's what God has done, and we're in a new season and a new opportunity, and he'll raise up others, you see. And so we are here for that purpose, to forget. We, we can't let what God's done affect you see, our outlook and get us stuck in the mud where we sit around and wish it was different and wish it was different. It's not. And God has a plan in that. And it's a great plan because he's a good God and he's going to do great and good things. We can't live in the past. We need to forget what is behind us. And we need to move on because he's moving on. And then we need to focus, number two, on what's in front of us. Focus on what's in front of us. That's what he's saying there in verse 13. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and then doing what? Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You see, there's two words that make all the difference in the world in that verse. And they are one thing. Paul understood the power that comes in concentrating on just one thing. I mean, have you ever thought about how important those words are in the Scripture? It was a rich young ruler. He had everything, man. He was driving the BMW, Mercedes. He was young, good-looking. He was in a position of authority. He was a ruler. He had all the bucks you could want and servants and everything. And he came to Jesus and he says, what do I need? Because with all that I have, I don't have the kind of life that I see you enjoying. What do I need to do? Jesus says, well, the commands. He says, well, I've kept all those from my youth. I've been a good boy. I've been a moral guy. I give, I help people, I feed the the, the homeless, you know, I, I, I help out those that are needy. I, I, I'm, I'm a good guy. I, I go to church regularly. Jesus didn't disagree with many of the things he said. But he said, listen, one thing you lack. One thing you lack. He focused them all in on one thing. When Martha and Mary were arguing, I mean, uh, not Mary, Martha was arguing with Mary, rather, over what was really important in life. She's out there in the kitchen going, hey, you, Martha, you, Mary, you need to get in here and help me, man. Uh, come on, I'm preparing a meal. And Jesus said to Martha, 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 you're busy about many things. You're troubled by many things. Only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that. Many things. Jesus pointed her to one thing. He pointed the rich young ruler to one thing. The psalmist David said in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. One thing. What? was the one thing that Paul was seeking. 
Well, he says, I press, there in verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Greek word for goal or mark, as it is in the New King James, comes from a word that means to look at. We get our word telescope from that same Greek word. It speaks of a small mark on which your eye is focused and fixed. In other words, Paul is saying here the key to living a productive life is about focus. And Paul had a one-track mind, and that mind was on the right track. I'm convinced the reason that so many Christians are so ineffective in their Christianity and their impact, you see, is the same reason why so many churches are ineffective in their mission, in their ministry, and that is because they are involved in many things and they don't really concentrate on one thing. I can tell you the amount of times that people come and say to me, you know, I'd like to serve in the church. I'd like to go on this mission trip. I, you know what, I'd like to give my testimony. I'd like to be involved in this study. But I've, right now I'm, I'm, I'm busy. i got too many irons in the fire. Too much going on. I say, well, you need to either get the irons out or shut off the fire. You need to serve Jesus. You see, too many of us are carrying shotguns around, firing buckshot everywhere. And, and, and we ought to be carrying rifles and aiming specifically and distinctly at the target that God has called us to hit. Or just shooting off everywhere. Heading off in every direction. Stressed out. Worn out. Anyone knows concentration is the secret of power. Let's take an illustration. You take a river and make that river flow in one direction and one direction only and not overflow its banks. We've built dams on those rivers and we've held back that water and we are able to generate electricity as that river is contained in its banks all behind that dam, every ounce of it going to directing electricity making, you see. If you take a light and you concentrate and you focus that beam, the power, as that beam is honed down and focused, it becomes what we call a laser. It is really focused light. And with that light, as that is concentrated light, it can cut through steel. Paul is saying, essentially, you set the right goals in your life. And not very many of them. And you build your life around reaching those few goals. And that's the key to making sure that you make progress over the next year. Let me just tell you, there's one goal that you need to make. More of a priority than any other. One goal that I'm going to encourage and challenge you to keep as a priority above all others. I heard about a football coach who was trying to teach his six-year-old son how to become a uh, place kicker. The first day he got down on his knees, he put the ball down, looked at his son and said, listen, when I nod my head, you kick it. You can tell what happened after he got his two front teeth replaced. You see, we need to be clear. And with that in our minds, I'm going to ask everyone who attends Calvary Chapel of the High Desert over the next 12 months, if you do nothing else to do one thing, just one thing is all I'm asking. 
One thing above all that you need to make a commitment to accomplish. And if it is the only thing you accomplish spiritually this year, the dividends are tremendous. And the reason I want you to commit to this one thing is because I know if you do this one thing that the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and move in your heart and the result will be many other things will be accomplished. What is that one thing? I'm going to ask you to read through your Bible this year. From cover to to cover verse after verse scripture after scripture to read through your Bible and listen there are plenty of one year plans if you have a smart device there is absolutely no excuse got an iPad an iPhone an Android a uh, Windows I don't care what whatever a device with a screen on it that you have other than a television You can get the U-Version Bible, and there's the chronological Bible one-year plan. There's the mixed Old and New Testament uh, uh, one-year plan. There's the, the New Testament with the Psalms one-year plan. And, and, you know, uh, the Old New Testament, rather, with the Psalms one-year plan. There's all kinds of plans. There are one-year Bibles that you can buy that you, you just turn to the date and the page. I mean, how easy is that? There's no reason for you not to commit to this. Because I'm absolutely convinced that the greatest single thing that I do on a daily basis is to tune in and listen to God speak to me. You want to hear from God? Guess where He speaks? He's written you a letter. It's the Bible. He speaks to you through His Word. And there's nothing that will feed your spirit. There's nothing that will encourage your heart. There's nothing that will lift the weight of the burdens and cares and motivate you to live for Jesus. Nothing that will cause you to grow in love for Him like reading the Word of God his love letter to you. And I'm going to ask you to make this your one thing for 2016. You're to forget what is behind. You're to focus on what is in front of you. And you're to fulfill what's ahead of you. Now for some of you, you might say, well, Pastor, like, Reading through the Bible in a year is a daunting, daunting task. I mean, that's huge. You, you say, like, this flies off your lips. Do you know what it looks like every day? I mean, that's a big book with a lot of pages. And, and Pastor, you don't understand, I, I don't like to read. And, um, you know, it's hard. Can I, can I say, suggest that over all those excuses and whatever more you may come up with, write over them one word, determination, discipline. Because that's what Paul's suggesting here. He's not saying it's going to be easy. When he says here, uh, listen, you've got to press on. you got to press on. The idea when he says, I'm pressing on, I'm reaching, I'm straining, I'm reaching out for that mark, for that goal. It's, the idea is this is not going to come easy. It's not going to be something that you're going to do half-heartedly and apathetically. You know, as baby boomers like me, Many of us have a problem. We've been raised to view success as something that's easy. You see, our generation doesn't know a whole lot about determination many times. Uh, 
perseverance and endurance and discipline. Oh, we grew up in the, hey, man, if it feels good, do it, man. Love the one you're with, you know. Peace, love, you know. We, that, that's the generation. Many have the attitude today, listen, when the boss gets unreasonable, you just quit. When the subject gets too difficult and you're, you're struggling with it in college, just drop the class. When your marriage gets unbearable and, and you start to struggle, get a divorce. I'm asking you today to consider a totally different tactic and to say this one thing I am going to do the one thing perhaps some of you have never done. But determine, this year I'm going to do it. Maybe something you never thought you could do. Something you know you should do. This year you need to determine to do. That one thing. It's not going to be easy. That's why you got to discipline yourself. you got to press towards it. you got to make a commitment to it. And you watch. You'll see. I hope by this time next year, every one of you can say, guess what? In 2016, I, for the first time in my life, read the whole Bible all the way through. And guess what? You know what 2017 is going to be if the Lord should tarry? I hope in 2018 you can say, in 2017 I've read the Bible all the way through. Pastor, why do you keep reading but I've read it and then I read it again? Let me ask you, did you eat this morning? <laughs> Are any of you planning on eating the rest of the day? Food is important, right? To your body physically. You eat, you get hungry, you eat again. Not every meal is memorable and spectacular. Sometimes it's just food. Sometimes the food you just, well, I, I took it, I paid for it, I'm just going to plow through it. I don't even like this. I'll never order it again. But, but you eat it. Why? Because you're hungry and you need food. What is true, you see, in the physical is also true in the spiritual. You need to feast. You need to eat. You need to partake daily of God's Word that you might be fed spiritually. You see, there's a prize here that Paul talks about. The prize, ultimately, is to fulfill God's purpose, to know and and have the peace and the joy and the life abundantly that he's designed and desires for us. But that will not come unless we commit to knowing God, to loving God. You see, the way that we love others is not simply doing good things and nice things for them and giving and out to them and helping them with needs physically, we need to give to them God's Word. We need to tell them the truth about life, about what's right, about what's wrong, about how to get right, about how to stay right. And that is all in the Word of God. One thing. One thing, if you just make this your aim, your goal, by the grace of God, through the power of the Spirit, to go through the Word, and then let the Word work in and through you and touch other lives. You see, that's what the Word does. All that pertain to life all that pertains to godliness and what godliness looks like is all wrapped up in the Word of God. Would you commit to reading your Bibles? You see, that's what the cross is all about. One thing, Jesus Christ and His death on that cross 
made a way for you as a sinful man, for me as a sinful uh, man, for you as a sinful woman to, to bridge the gap, to make connection as sinners with a holy God. Jesus, in all his holiness and beauty, hung on that cross and he bore the shame and the guilt of your sin. He took the punishment that you and I deserve there on that cross of Calvary. From the day he was born, that was his commitment. When he was struggling, he says, nevertheless, not my will. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, let it pass. I, I don't want to go through this. And yet, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, it was all about the will of God. You won't know the will of God without the word of God. You won't be able to accomplish the work of God without the, the Word of God. You won't see the beauty and the wonder of God without the Word of God. You need to commit to the Word so that God can do the work. What are you going to do? One thing. Just one thing this year over and above everything else. Just one thing. If you keep that resolution a revolution will start not only in your own heart, but you will impact the lives of others. It will impact the church corporately, and God will be glorified. What a great year it's going to be. God's got great things in store for this church. He's got great things in store for you. Oh, yeah, but if you looked at the world, yeah. But you know what? I look at the Lord and guess what? I know how the story ends. And guess what else? We're winning. We're on his team. We win. So we just work and know God's will and wait until he comes. That our walk with him, as a result of being in his word, will be stronger. That the things that he does through us and in us, will be greater than experienced previously and that we will bring him glory increasingly. That's the goal. One thing, dig into the word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit at work in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you've told us there's something that needs to happen, uh, Lord, if we are going to be those that are going to, Lord, attain, that we are going to experience greater satisfaction and fulfillment and usefulness and purpose. We're going to experience greater power and impact. God, we need to forget those things which are behind and we need to press towards that mark of the high calling in Christ. The one thing, Lord, to know you, that we may show you to the world that is looking, seeking, trying to find out why we're here and what we're doing here and how to deal with the problems, how to, uh, Lord, help, those that are struggling in their marriages, in their families, with their finances. Lord, we thank you that your word deals with all those issues. May we grow in wisdom. May we have greater knowledge and understanding of your will for our lives as your people. And Lord, I pray if there's any here that have not yet given their lives to you, Lord, that they would not walk out of these doors today. Lord, continuing the course that they're on, but in this new year, Lord, that they might come to Christ and experience the new life, the abundant life, the power to break the chains of addiction and the slavery of sin. Lord, a new hope. Because, Lord, there's a Savior who we celebrated at Christmas who died on a cross, Lord, to take the shame to take the blame for their sins, Lord, and to pay that price. 
that we might be forgiven, that we might have the hope of heaven, that we might, Lord, have the peace and the power of God for living here day in and day out. Lord, I pray if there's any here that have not yet given their lives to you, Lord, that they would come today and give their lives to Jesus Christ, putting their faith and their hope in him who died on the cross in their place, who took what they deserve for their sin. Draw those that don't know you to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.